The devil knows if he gets you now, most likely he has you for the rest of your life. He knows that. God knows the same thing. You see, the devil and God work the same way. Let me explain that quickly before I am thrown out of the church. God advertises the benefits of the gospel. The devil advertises the benefits of sin. So he told Eve in Genesis chapter 3 verse 5, For God doth know in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The devil advertises the supposed benefits of sin to make it attractive. God advertises the benefits of the gospel to make it attractive. They work the same way. The devil believes in brainwashing. By that I mean constantly bombarding you with his messages. God does the same thing. Teach them to your children when you're lying down, when you're rising up, when you're in the way, when you're in the home. Just constant bombardment of the word. They both use the same techniques. In Acts chapter 2, from verse 1, Now when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord and in one place. One accord is a powerful way to function. The devil does the same thing. When Stephen preached his powerful sermon in Acts chapter 7, the Bible says they rushed on him with one accord to kill him, and they killed him. So, techniques that work are used both by God and the devil. I said that to say, God knows the sooner he gets you, the more likely he is to keep you. The devil knows the sooner he gets you, the more likely he is to keep you. The question becomes, whom will you allow to get you? It's up to you. So I just want to tell you, the gospel is not for all people. Hell is for all ages. Yesterday when we spoke about the Amalekites, 1 Samuel 15.3, listen to what God told Saul to do. Go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. But slay both man and woman, infant and suckling. Genesis chapter 19, verse 4. When Lot entertained the angels, the Bible says, But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young. Did you hear what I said? Not what I said, what the Bible said. Both old men and young boys came to sodomize the angels. So, uh, if sin can operate... In the youth, and it does. Ooh. Righteousness can operate in the youth. That's what God wants so badly. And I pray that something in this conference in the remaining days will create in you a desire for spiritual decency, uprightness. When I was a little boy, I don't know why I'm saying all of this, this is not my presentation. <laughs> there, there's a term we use as young people. It was called infradig, which is a short version of infradignitatum. Infradignitatum is an, a Latin phrase means beneath my dignity. In other words, I don't do that. That's not for me. So someone says to you, or to one of us when we were small, let's smoke. We would say, no, that is infradig. Meaning what? It is beneath my, I don't do that. Let's rob a bank. No, I don't do that. That is beneath my dignity. Well, someone says, let's commit fornication. You must say the same thing. Mm -mm. I don't do that. That is what? Beneath my spiritual dignity. Let's cheat on the exam. Mm -mm. That is infradig. What does that mean? Beneath. I don't do that. Because I'm a prince. Why am I a prince? Why am I a prince? Because my father is whom? And he's a king. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All princesses, may I see your right hand? No, don't, don't, don't pray about it. Just Any princesses? None? Ah, we have one. God bless you. Is God your father, yes or no? Is God king? What does that make you? I ask again at the risk of getting a sore throat. Are there any princesses present this morning? May I see your hands, whether they're manicured or not? Okay. God bless you.
let's see. Any princess, I know the hands would go up quickly. Men are very aggressive. God bless you. God bless you. You know, this is not symbolic. This is literal. <laughs> this is literal. If God is your father and God is king, you are a prince and a princess. The world may not see it that way, but that's the way it is. All right, let's get into our message. Our theme is excellence today, excellence in health. Before I begin, uh, where's my phone? There it is. If you don't need this for any reason, please turn it off. And I'll turn mine off. Even if you need it, because the Bible is on it, you don't need sound. And please don't go to WhatsApp and uh, whatever else, Safari, and download badminton games. Is that what Malaysia does very well, badminton? Aren't you the best in the world at badminton? I think you are. Mm -hmm. Won't get you to heaven though, so uh, be best in the word of God. Okay, favor number two, while I'm speaking, what should you do? And what will you say? Lord, put what? Your words where? In that man's mouth. You know, I mean that with all my heart. I may say things that sound intelligent, sound smart, but they have no value as far as your salvation. I really don't. This will change your life. Mm -hmm. Ellen White writes in Christ's Object Lessons, page 100, paragraph 1, The scriptures are the great agency in the transformation of character. If studied and obeyed, the word of God works in the heart, subduing every unholy attribute. Listen again. If studied and obeyed, my favorite word, the word of God works in the heart, subduing, controlling, pulling down every unholy attribute. What is an unholy attribute? You know, watching sites on the internet you shouldn't watch. Uh, trying to dress like the world, half naked. What's an uh, unholy attribute? Selfish. Self-centered, always thinking of you. Never thinking of anyone else. What's an unholy attribute? Always trying to make yourself available to the opposite sex. What is an unholy attribute? Always lying. What's an unholy attribute? Always late. Eloi says, if studied and obeyed, this, not the words of Randy Ski, works in the heart. Subduing. Does it happen overnight? No, but it will happen. Okay. So ask God to put his words in my mouth. And favor number three, I want you to think as you listen. How many of you have been thinking so far during the conference? Anyone has been thinking? No one has been thinking? No. <laughs> you make me smile. You really do. Is it your culture not to answer? Let's talk. Let's talk quietly. Let's talk. Is it your culture not to answer? Yes or no? Why? Because what? Oh, you are brought up that way. Don't answer the preacher. I understand. Just ignore the man. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, let us not fight. I accept it. God bless you. You're still my brothers and sisters. All right. Let's pray. God in heaven, we are just grateful for life this lovely Monday. We woke up to some drizzles, but Father, the earth needs the rain. And the rain reminds us of the latter and the early rain. If we've offended you, dear God, this morning, forgive us, please. Father, when we sin, we really don't want to hurt you. But forgive us, we pray, and grant us your spirit, dear God. Help us to listen with our hearts, not just our ears. Put your words in my mouth, Father. Help me to be conscious of the fact that everything I say must represent you. I humble myself before you. Take all the glory, dear God, and grant me your spirit and bless my brothers and sisters. Bless all the presentations, I pray. Possess the minds of the speakers. Bless the equipment. Let our presence in this place be a witness to this area. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Well, let's go to chapter 2. Chapter 2. We'll read verse 19. Excellence in health. Do you have Genesis 2.19? The Bible says, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the earth, and every fowl of the air, 
and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, finish the verse, that was the name thereof. Now, God brought the animals to Adam. Must have been a remarkable sight. Similar to the animals coming to Noah and the ark. Here comes all these animals, the leopard, the lion, the crocodile, the, uh, the elephant, the bat, the cat. And God leaves it up to Adam to decide what names they would have. God could have chosen the names. He left it up to Adam. Let me stress that point. He left it up to Adam. The Bible tells us every name Adam chose, God agreed with. Verse 19 ends by saying, And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. God did not disagree with one name. Remarkable communication between God and Adam. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. We read verse uh, 23. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Now finish the verse with me. She shall be called. Why? Because she was taken out of man. Now Adam gives Eve a name. What's that name? Woman. Does God change it? No. Genesis 3, 2, 23, sorry. Genesis 2, 23. Did I say 3, 23? Yes. And why didn't you correct me? <laughs> you did the same thing to me yesterday. You left me in quicksand and smiled as I sank. All right. Genesis 2, 23. Jeez. I don't understand why I like you. Okay. Genesis 2, 23. And Adam said, this is my bone of my bone, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called what? Woman. Why? Because she was taken out of man. So this is the second occasion we have Adam naming and God agreeing. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. That one is correct. Genesis 3, verse 20. The animals get names from Adam. God accepts every name. The woman gets a name. She's called woman. God accepts that. Verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the what? Mother of all living. The third time, God leaves it up to Adam to decide to choose a name. Why do you think God could do that? Now, please, go against your culture. He's a creator? Okay. One reason, he's creator. Why do you think God could trust Adam to come up with the right names? Because he had a connection with the mind of God. Adam's mind was plugged into God's mind. By the way, you and I can have that same relationship without a change. I say again, you and I can have the same relationship through obedience of faith. Your mind connected to the mind of God. Imagine the effect it will have on your mind. All right. Any other reason why God allowed Adam to choose? All right. They were connected. Let's go to Genesis 1. Let's read verse 29 and verse 30. Our subject... Excellence in health. We have seen how God trusted Adam to give names to the animals and twice to name his wife. First time he called her woman. Second time he called her Eve. Do we have Genesis 1.29? And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life. Finish the verse. I have given every green herb for me. Now, what has God chosen for Adam? Give me one word. Based on what we just read, I want one word as a response. What did God choose for Adam? Food. Give me another word. 
diet. This man knows everything. <laughs> diet. Now, what did we say about God and Adam, about naming the animals, naming Eve? What did we say about God and Adam? God did what? He left it up to Adam to name all the animals. He left it up to Adam <coughs> to name his wife twice. He does not leave it up to Adam to decide his diet. God does that. Why? Take a wild guess. You'll probably be right. Why do you think God does not leave it up to Adam to decide what his diet would be? God chooses it personally and very specifically. Why? Why do you think God would do that? All right, perfect health. Any other reason? Is diet important? It must be not just important, extremely important that God can't even trust a perfect man to make the choice. God makes it himself. Listen to me carefully. Diet affects spirituality. Diet either adds to or diminishes the character of God, the image of God in us. Diet is absolutely important. We're talking about excellence in health. Let's go to my brother's book, Daniel chapter 1. We'll read from verse 1. Daniel 1, reading from verse 1. What we're about to read occurred in the life of Daniel when he was, and scholars believe, still a teenager. Just like you. Maybe younger than many of you. If you found that passage, say amen. The Bible says, In the third year of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes. Now, if you have verse 4, read it with me. Children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace. Keep reading, verse 5. And the king appointed them what? A daily provision of what? The king's meat. And of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years. Finish the verse. That at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now, go to verse 18. What does verse 18 say? Now, what? At the end of the days, that the what? King has said that he should bring them in. Then the prince of the eunuchs did what? Brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Now, I want you to look at 18 and look at 4. Not 4, uh, 5. 5 ends by saying, thus nourishing them three years that they might stand before the king. Verse 18 says, now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuch brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Now they're standing before. And he will examine them based on what they have learned. Are you with me? But verse 5 tells us that part of, ex part of their standing before the king was based on their diet. Put the two together. Nebuchadnezzar understood, whether his facts were correct or not, that their academic excellence would be affected by their dietary choices. Their standing before the king, verse 18, was to be examined to see what they had learned. It's like an oral examination. What have you learned in three years? But the diet was a contributing factor to their study experience. Diet, the king understood, affected the mind. 
Let's continue reading. Let's go to verse 6. Now among these were of the children of, his, of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of what? Belteshazzar. And to Hananiah of Shadrach. And to Mishael of Meshach. And to Azariah of Abednego. Verse 8. Read verse 8 with me now. I want to hear you. He says, But Daniel purposed in his heart, read on, that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, come on, read on, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Let's look at that passage microscopically. There are four things that happened to those four boys. Name the four boys. Name them so I can hear you. Daniel. Okay, we know Daniel. Drop Daniel. Give me the names of the three Hebrew boys, not the Babylonian names, the names God gave them. What are they? Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. I no longer call them Shadrach, Mishael. You don't have to do that. But I just prefer to use the names that God gave them. Not the names heathens gave them, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Belteshazzar, all connected to Babylonian gods. Now we have Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. What were the four things that happened to them as a result of the captivity of Judah? What happened to them in Babylon? We read eight verses. Where were they from? Judah, where are they in that story? Where? What happened to them? They were separated, they were captured, they were, they were relocated. Are you with me? Now, it's a traumatic thing to pluck someone up from his homeland and take him to strange land against his will. Number one, those four boys were relocated forcibly. It's like Indonesia attacks Malaysia and carries away all of you off to uh, and put you in some jungle in Papua. Forcibly. What's another thing that happened to them? Look at verse 4. Look at the end of verse 4. What happened to them? What's that? Who? No, look at verse 4, the end of verse 4. Yes, that happened too, sister. I won't make it public, but that happened too. But, uh, but that's... Say that again. A different educational system. A different, that they might, whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Now they go from a Bible-based curriculum to a heathen curriculum. That's two. What else happened to them? Hmm? Their names were changed, verse 6 and 7. Verses 6 and 7. Na now, names are important. My name is Randy. The proper name is really Randolph. I'm called Randy. But when people buy tickets for me, I'm very quick to write them and say, look, don't buy a ticket for Randy Skeet. It's not on my passport. It is Randolph Skeet. Names. When you hear your name, something happens to you emotionally. If 10 years from now I see you and I remember your name, oh, you'll dance. You'll be shocked. He remembered my name or vice versa. Their names were changed. That's two. Something else happened to them. What? The diet was changed. From a Leviticus diet to a Babylon diet. What else happened to them? We have they were relocated. Different curriculum. Names changed. What else? Hmm? The what? What? Diet. Oh, oh, yes, the diet. Yes, so we have the diet change, the name change, the curriculum change, and the location change. Let's go over that again. Location first, they had to be moved. Name change, diet change, curriculum change. Those are major changes to seriously spiritual boys. Now, think with me. By the way, the title for this afternoon, if I give it one, is The Great Controversy. This morning. Excellence in health. Does the Bible record that Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah put up a fight against being relocated? 
Did they carry placards and march down the highway of Babylon? Take us back home. No. No. Did they protest the change of their names? No. Listen to me. It's not what people call you. It's what you call yourself. Now, throughout the book of Daniel, Daniel calls himself what? Daniel, not Belteshazzar. Who else calls him Daniel? Hmm? Your three friends, sure. But who else? God, through Gabriel. Gabriel calls him Daniel. Even though Nebuchadnezzar would call him Belteshazzar. And Darius called him, not Darius, but Belshazzar. Belteshazzar, he called himself Daniel. Gabriel called him Daniel. Which name did heaven recognize? Daniel. But even so, the Bible records no opposition those boys expressed to a change of name. Is there an opposition to a change of curriculum? No. You want to teach us Hebrew, uh, Babylonian? Fine. We have the foundation to sustain whatever negative elements are in your curriculum. We have a foundation that will keep us strong. The, the Hebrew educational system. Did they resist the dietary change? Yes. Now let's think again. Hmm? In Eden, did God trust Adam to name the animals? Yes or no? Did he trust him to name Eve? Yes or no? Did he trust him to pick his diet? No. Then diet must be so important, God decides, no, I'll choose that for you. I'll choose that. Yes, your mind is perfect. I will decide your diet. Because your diet will affect your reflection of my image. The three Hebrew boys plus Daniel. We're transported. We're relocated. We can live with that. They change our names. We can live with that. They change our textbooks. We can live with that. They change our food. What am I about to say? Come on. We cannot live with that. We are not eating that food. That was a great controversy. <laughs> it created a controversy. My brothers and sisters, something else about Daniel. What did the angel tell Daniel in Daniel 12, I believe about verse 4 or 5? What did he tell him to do with the book? Seal it up. Shut up the words. Until when? Time of the end. When did the time of the end begin according to Adventist uh, eschatology and prophecy? 1798. Study it. The time of the end began in 1798. The end of time began in 1844. They're two different things. Now, that book was sealed up. Now, in Revelation 10, John sees an angel with a little book. And he had in his hand a little book open. Revelation 10, verse 2. That's the book of Daniel. Because the angel Daniel saw with one foot on the land, one foot on the sea, in Daniel 12, was Christ. The angel he sees, that John sees in Revelation 10, was Christ. Christ has a little book now, and it's open. In Daniel 12, it's closed. In Revelation 10, it's open. It is open, and the first chapter of that book is about a crisis of diet. Now, what does that tell you about diet and understanding God's Word? Well, since you won't answer me, and you won't change overnight, let me give you my answer. Many of us do not understand the Bible because of the way we eat. Either we eat the wrong things or we eat too much of the right things. Many students sleep in school first thing in the morning because of the kind of breakfast they had. Not that they have, uh, what's it, attention... Deficit disorder, whatever it is that 
so many children like to say that are diagnosed as having, and they put on medication. It may be traced to the diet. My brothers and my sisters, listen to me. What you eat affects you spiritually, mentally, psychologically, in every single way. In 3 John, let's go there with me. You know that verse very well, but let's go there. Way towards the back of the Bible, find Revelation. Come forward, you find Jude. And right next to Jude is 3 John. We'll read verse 2. Do you have that? Read verse 2. What does it say? Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest and be in even as thy soul, a desire of God for us is that we have good health. Because health affects spirituality. Now, there's also the reverse. Spirituality affects health. The more spiritual you are, the more you're benefited physically. Listen to a quotation from Ellen White. Listen very carefully, write it down. Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 1, page 34, paragraph 3. Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 1, page 34, paragraph 3. If you have some computer open, you may check it. Here's what Ellen White writes. Let the mind become intelligent. And the will be placed on the Lord's side. And there will be a wonderful improvement in the physical health. Should I say that again? All right. What's the reference? Mind, character, and personality. Volume 1, page 34, paragraph 3. Let the mind become intelligent. And the will, the will is where you and I say yes or no, where we choose. And the will become, be placed on the Lord's side. And there will be a wonderful improvement in the physical health. And so the benefits flow in both directions. Your diet affects your spirituality. Your spirituality affects your health. Everything physical, I seem I've observed, has a spiritual parallel. Let's show you what I mean. Let's go to John 6. John 6, we'll read from verse 51. Our subject, excellence in health. The Bible says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall what? Live forever. And the bread that? The bread that what? I will give is my flesh, go on, which I shall give for the life of the world. Now Christ is calling himself, I am bread. Keep in mind in that chapter... Christ fed 5,000 with fish and bread. Read it from verse 1 to about verse 12. The crowd followed him, verse 25. Master, whence camest thou hither, or rabbi? He said, very, very soon to you. Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. So bread is the theme right through eating bread. It goes from physical to spiritual. Jesus says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. At a physical level, what do you do with bread? What am I going to do with this when we take a break? <laughs> you eat bread. Where does the bread go? The digestive processes take over. The, whatever is beneficial, the vitamins, the miracles, the, what else do you have? The proteins, they're extracted and taken where? They're taken by what? The blood to where? The cells. To nourish? Yes. Jesus says, let's go to verse 53. 
You see, the Pharisees in verse 52 said, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? What does verse 53 say? What does it say? Read it. Then Jesus what? Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. Finish the verse. Ye have no life. Now, Christ is using a physical reality to teach a spiritual lesson. Do we eat to preserve our lives, yes or no? Yes. Christ says at the spiritual level, the same thing happens. You eat bread to preserve your life. That bread, of course, is this. Verse 24. Read on. Whoso eateth my flesh and hath, and I will raise him up. Yes. That verse, what did I say verse it is? 54, yes. For my flesh is what? And my blood is? Verse 55. Verse 56, what does that say? He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. Ah, let's look at that. You in Christ, Christ in you. All mixed up. Christ says, we're talking about excellence and health. If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, that's your spiritual diet. I'll be in you. You'll be in me. Have you heard the saying, you are what you eat? You know that's true. That is true not only at the physical level. It is true at the spiritual level. You are Finish my words. What you eat? Now, if you eat this, hmm? <laughs> what do you become? Like? Like Christ. Literally. Because when you eat this, you see, the digestion takes place of here in the mind. It goes to your spiritual cells and nourishes you spiritually. And then you become what you eat. Hmm? Spiritual people. Just like Jesus. You don't become Jesus, you become like Jesus. And so we have, at the physical level, to preserve health, we have to eat and drink what is good for us. Not alcohol or... Uh, this is not pork, I'm sure, or clams, or chowder, or lobsters, or... Health, physical, and health, spiritual, function the same way. One affects the other. In the United States, billions of dollars are wasted every year... Because of people who have to take sick days and stay home. Billions. People are sick. It happens in Malaysia. It happens in every country. Then health is a cost-saving device. The healthier you are, the more effectively you can serve God. Mm -hmm. Not always sick at home. Can't go to church. Can't go do canvassing, can't knock door to door, always sick at home. The healthier we are, the more effectively we can serve God. Now let me bring in something else. Let's go to the Ten Commandments. Where are they found? Where else are they found? Deuteronomy 5. Alright. The difference is, in Deuteronomy 5, Moses is recalling... In Exodus 20, he's writing what God is saying word for word. All right. We're looking at the Ten Commandments. We're looking at Commandment 6. That should be about page, uh, verse 13 or 14. 13, I think. What does 13 say? Thou shalt not kill. All right. Let's look at thou shalt not kill. What does that mean? Has anyone here ever killed anyone? You killed somebody? And you're walking free? Okay. I was preaching in a certain part of the world. I won't say what part. This is serious. 
And um, I was telling people to confess their sins. Forgive others who've hurt them. At the end of the service, this man came to me. He said, I need to talk to you. We went to a little room. He said, Pastor, I've killed someone. 20 years ago. Literally, physically killed somebody. Now, I don't think any of you has ever done that. The Bible says, thou shalt not kill. So you've never killed anyone. Have you been keeping that commandment? Yes or no? You have. Is that yes? What does it mean by thou shalt not kill? Thou shalt not kill whom? I heard it. Say it again. Includes yourself. Not simply thou shalt not kill thy neighbor or the homeless man who slept under your front porch. Thou shalt not kill anything. Do not kill yourself. Now how do we kill ourselves? Our lifestyle choices. Most people in the United States die from what is known as degenerative diseases. Cancer, heart disease, that sort of thing, diabetes. And they are highly, highly preventable just by changing lifestyle choices. Multiple thousands of people literally kill themselves by the dietary choices they make. I'm a black man. In the United States, black people have a certain kind of diet. We call it soul food. It is greasy. Everything fried. <laughs> fried chicken. Fried this. Grease. We have twice as much hypertension. <laughs> Maybe twice as much obesity. Twice as much, what is it, uh, the effect that diabetes has on the eyes? Retinol something? Hmm? Now, who's doing that to us? We are. Clogged arteries, blocked veins, stuffed up capillaries. Just because of what goes in here. The Bible says... Thou shalt not kill. Then, health is a matter of obeying one of the Ten Commandments. Are you following me? All right. Let me make it more severe. There are two kinds of commandments in the Bible. What are they? Or two laws. What are they? The ceremonial law and the... Say it loudly. The ceremonial law and the... Come on, say it loudly. The moral law. All right, let's go through the moral law. Commandment one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Is that a moral requirement? Mm -hmm. If you have another god before God, are you engaging in immorality? Yes. All ten are moral laws. When you worship an image, is that immorality? When you take God's name in vain, you say you're a Christian, but you dress like a, a demon. Is that immorality? When you break the Sabbath, are you being immoral, yes or no? Because all ten are moral. God is a moral God. That sets him apart from all other gods. You see the other gods, they, they sleep with each other, they have children, and they sleep with this one, that one. That's where they function, all the other gods. Of course, they don't exist, but, you know, mythology. So Zeus had... Slept with this woman, had a child, and then some other woman and some man slept with an animal and had a baby and all kinds of rubbish. God is a moral God. He gave a moral code. Now, listen to commandment 6. Thou shalt not kill. Is that moral to preserve your health? Yes or no? Yes. Because the health laws come out of the 6th commandment. Thou shalt not kill. Now, reverse that. If you shouldn't kill, what should you do? Preserve life. Preserve life. And why says, God has laws he has instituted, which, if observed, will keep men from disease and premature death. 
In other words, he's saying, too many die before their time because they do not obey the health laws. God has laws which he has instituted, which, if obeyed, will keep men from, prem- from disease and premature death. The commandment that says, thou shalt not kill, effectively says, thou shalt preserve life. Beginning with yours. So when you go to Wendy's, I saw Wendy's when, where was I? Where were we? I was with uh, Dr. Sliger, Pastor Sliger. And we were, oh, we had landed in Penang. Not Penang, uh, Kuala Lumpur. We had to go from KLIA to KLIA 2 by some sort of train. So we got on the train. When we got to Penang, we're going up some stairs to get to where the flights are. And I saw a sign for Wendy's and I pointed to him, there's Wendy's. Very common in the United States. Do you have Kentucky Fried Chicken, now called KFC? You have that. You have McDonald's. You have Burger King. And you have your own kind. All these little stalls alongside the road, uh, you have a lot of that stuff. When you decide to eat, that choice is a moral choice. But too many of us, we see morality as only don't commit adultery. If an adulterer, oh, you're immoral. That man is immoral. He has two wives. He breaks the Sabbath. He's not immoral. He's just unwise. Go to 1 Corinthians 6. Let's read verse 19 and 20. Verses 19 and 20 of 1 Corinthians 6. Let me see when the other session begins. I need a break myself. It's not easy to speak four times in a day. You know, when you preach from your heart, it gets you tired. The average preacher, when he gets over the pulpit, the first place he wants to see is a bed. <laughs> Take a spiritual nap. You understand? All right. Uh, what book did I say? What verses? 16 and, not 16, 19 and 20. What does 19 say? What? Know ye not that what? Your body is a temple of what? Which? Which ye have of? And ye are not your? Stop. Is that from Revelation or from Corinthians? Is it literal or symbolic? This is literal. The Bible says you are not your own. If you loaned me your car, I will be more careful with your car than with mine. Are you with me? Because I want to return it to you in the same condition in which you gave it to me. God has loaned us this. And he says, for the duration of the loan, which can be an eternity, take care of what's mine. Don't put smoke in it. It's not a chimney. Don't fill it up to your throat with alcohol. Don't pierce it. Don't cut it. Don't put tattoos on it. Don't paint it. Just keep it as I gave it. Preserve it. Verse 20. What does that say? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God. Go on. In your body. Go on. And in your spirit, go on, which are God's. Not just your body, but the non-physical part of you belongs to God. Now, go to Revelation, not Revelation, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Our subject, excellence in health. You know that verse very well. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. What does the Bible say? Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. So we go back to Wendy's now. When you sit down at the table with your young friends on a Saturday night, because you're happy the sun has set. Now don't look innocent, I know you're guilty. You know how many Adventists rejoice when the sun sets? When I was a little boy at the church, I would look through the window. (laughs) Has the sun set? Because I want to play. Or turn on the radio or run outside with my friends. We had no TV back then. That's way before your parents were born. And, and we're looking at the window. We love God, yes. We love Jesus, but we want the sun to set. <laughs> so we can do things that won't break the Sabbath. 
I say again, when you sit Saturday night in Wendy's or Burger King or KFC or Malaysia Fried Chicken, when you sit there, do you not realize how you choose glorifies God or disgraces God? You have to choose like a holy person. Listen to the Bible. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, what do you choose at McDonald's? Soy milk, a vegetarian sandwich. God is happy. Chicken legs, Coke, whether diet free or what, God is not. Let me tell you what happened to me several years ago. I was going to Los Angeles to preach a weekend at an Indonesian church, by the way. And uh, the pastor picked me up and he said, are you hungry? I said, yes. So we went to a restaurant on the way taking me to the hotel. We sat down and the waitress came for our order. When she looked at it, she looked at us and said, are you vegetarians? Why did she say that? Come on, come on, come on. Surprise me. Be uncultural and surprise me. Why did she say that? She saw what? No meat. So she said, are you vegetarian? The pastor said, yes. Now, we weren't trying to impress anyone. We're just hungry. We're eating what we usually eat. That was a witness, right? You know what she said? She said, I want to be a vegetarian, but I can't. In other words, it's hard. I saw that as a cry for help. And I told the pastor, get the book, Councils on Dance of Foods, on Ministry of Healing, have the entire church board sign it, go back, find this young lady, give it to her. Just by the way we chose from a menu, conviction came to someone's heart. Now, if we had chosen ribs and uh, cow heel, popular in the West Indies, and, uh, you know, whatever, chicken lips, and, uh, you know, if we had chosen that, hmm, would she have said, are you carnivores? Do you not understand? You don't have to wait until you're in church. <laughs> Your chickens have lips. Until you're in church to be holy. Holiness is a lifestyle. Somebody say amen. amen. I grew up with chickens that had lips. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> uh, God is good. And all the time. My friends, let me uh, appeal to your heart. You know, you're good people. You really are. You, I, I was in my room. I said, Father, I just can't believe I fought with them so badly two nights ago. And they just still come and they're so nice. And I, I almost started to feel badly. You know, I said, <laughs> I really was praying for them. I said, Father, they're so nice. Despite what I did to them. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let your culture take you to hell, please. <laughs> Listen to me. If, God, if Christ doesn't come, what you are doing now by being healthy, you are laying the foundation for a healthy, advanced life. Are you with me? Every human being has a limited supply of vital force. And as you live, some is spent, some is spent, some is spent. A lot of people in their 70s, 80s, 90s who are still vigorous because they laid a foundation. You must have read the article in the National Geographic maybe eight, nine years ago where they studied three populations of people trying to understand why they're so vigorous in their advanced years. Adventists in Loma Linda, people on the island of Okinawa and somewhere in some mountain in Nepal or something. Because they were still vigorous. Excellence in health. When Adventists in Loma Linda are studied, they routinely have lower rates of all the major diseases. And it has been shown they live an average of between five and seven years longer than the average population. Why? Faithfulness to health. God's diet is the best. Meat free. Listen to God as he talks to Adam. Genesis 1, 29. And uh, God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing what? Seed, which is upon the face of the earth. 
And every tree into which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for me. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for me. God's design and desire was, every living thing would eat plants. The lion used to eat plants. The bear, the grizzly, plants. Human beings, plant life. Different plants, of course, but plant life. Why and how did meat eating come about? Give me one word. Sin. Now, let's reason and I'll end. Here is God's diet given when there was no sin. Here is the popular diet today, meat, which began because of sin. Now, in the new world, we go back to God's recommendation. So, we have meatless before sin, meat during sin, meatless after sin. Now, if you and I are preparing to be part of that meatless world, hmm, what should be part of our preparation? Practicing that lifestyle now. Let me say it again. Meat eating originated because of sin. Plant-based diet originated out of sinlessness. Which one should appeal to us? Let me tell you something else. God prefers the ideal. Ideal. You know, in a Matthew 19, go to Matthew 19 quickly, then I'll end. I keep saying I'll end all the time. Matthew 19, go there quickly. Let's read from verse 3. Excellence in health. Do you have that? The Bible says what? The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him what? Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? What does verse 4 say? And he answered and said what? Have ye not read? By the way, stop. Stop. Why do you think Jesus said, have ye not read? Let me ask you a question. Do you read? I don't mean your textbooks. Do you read? Jesus is saying, if you had been reading, you would not ask me that question. I ask you again, do you read? When was the last time you read a book from Ellen White? When was the last time you read through one of the books of the Bible? A long one, Isaiah 66 chapters. When was the last time you read something from one of the pioneers, Jane Andrews? Ellen White, James White. Second generation, Wagner, Jones, Prescott, Stephen and Haskell. When? And so Jesus says, have you not read? Listen to me, my young friends. Read. Read this. Read Ellen White. Read the pioneers in that order. Bible, Ellen White pioneers. Ellen White says we must reprint what the pioneers have written because they study the Bible in such a way that we don't understand today. And so Jesus said, have you not read? Pick up the reading with me now. That he which made them, come on, read. At the beginning made them. Notice the words of Jesus. He which made them when? At the beginning. What is Christ going back to? Creation, when Adam and Eve were put together before sin. What he's saying is, what God intended then is what, what, is that what he wants now. He intended Adam and Eve to remain together. He still desires that now. In other words, God prefers things they were the way they were before sin. Now they're asking the question after thousands of years of sin. But Christ goes back for the answer to a time when there was no sin. Because God still prefers the way it was in Eden before sin. What am I saying? The ideal diet is the one God gave. That's ideal. Then there is an, a diet that is allowed. That's meat. Sin led to the flood. The flood destruction of the earth. Nothing to eat. Animals out of the ark. They provided food. This is ideal before sin. This is just allowed. Now, let me apply that academically. You'll understand. What classes are you taking right now? 
No, in school. Oh, medical mystery training. Okay, what class are you taking in school? Hmm? Okay, who's in college? What class are you taking right now? Oh, when you return to school? Business. What's the highest grade you can get? What's the lowest you can get and pass? No, not you, but what's the lowest grade anyone can get and pass at your school? A C. Okay. So we have what goes up here? What goes down here? What do you shoot for when you go to school? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is ideal. What's this? Allowed. We will get you through with a C. We'll push you through that narrow opening of C with much effort. But an A, you just walk out. You go to school, you want an A. That's ideal. In health, God wants an A. Not a C for carnivore. He wants A for Adventist. Can you say amen? <laughs> Listen, let me close the book. Do yourself a favor. Change your diet if necessary. Now, for those of you who eat meat as if it's your spiritual gift, let me uh, make a recommendation to you. I am not telling you change overnight right now. No. What I'll say is go on a reduction program. If you eat meat seven days a week and twice on Sunday, then I'm suggesting let's try it six days a week and once on Sunday. Then for, let's do that for three weeks. Then another three weeks, five days a week and not on Sunday. Three weeks later, four days a week and not on Sunday. Then three days. You see, we can change any habit if we do it gradually. People who are afraid to fly, don't remember what that is called, but they're afraid to fly. Or if you're afraid of a snake, you go to a uh, uh, psychologist to get you over that fear. What he may do is have you look at a picture of a snake. Okay? And uh, you look at a picture and you're horrified, you're backing up. You look at the picture and day after day you come in for your session, you look at the picture. Then finally he gets you to pick up the book with the picture of the snake. And you're comfortable. Are you following me? Then after a few weeks he brings in a rubber snake. And you back up two and a half miles. <laughs> and you, then you start coming closer to the rubber snake until after several sessions, he has you holding the rubber snake. And you realize, I'm not dead. Then he brings in a living snake in a cage. All right? And you back up again. Then session after session, you come closer, you come closer. Gradually, you're improving. Then he removes the cage and the snake is out. And you don't run. Do you know he will get you to do what eventually? Pick up that snake. But it happened. What's the word? Gradually. Now I'm not going to tell you stop eating meat today. What I'm going to say to you is ask God for help. To gradually get off it. Your health will improve. Your mind will improve. And most importantly, your spirituality will improve. Let me say it again. Mind, character, and personality, volume 1, page 34, paragraph 3. Let the mind become intelligent, and the will be placed on the Lord's side, and there will be a wonderful improvement in the physical health. When we do what's right spiritually, we benefit physically. When we do what's right physically, we benefit spiritually. You are what you eat. You eat the Word of God, you become like God without becoming God. And so I say to you, my dear friends, you are morally required to take care of your body. Morally required. The laws of health are as sacred as the moral law because they come out of the moral law. How many of you will say with me, Father, help me to take care of my health that I may glorify you in my eating and drinking. May I see your right hand? I want you to mean it. Mean it. Hands down. Sickness is not necessary, as widespread as it is. Yes, things happen, but most cases of sickness are not necessary if we would simply change our choices, our eating, our drinking, our resting, our working, our recreation. We make those changes, and we will live healthy lives that glorify God.
heads bowed, eyes closed. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you to God for the example of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We thank you that you desire above all things that we will have good health. Dear God in heaven, help us in all we do to strive for the ideal, spiritually and physically. And if any young man or young woman embarks upon a program of eating less and less meat until he or she gets to the place where none is consumed, bless that person's effort, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. This media was brought to you by Audioverse, a website dedicated to spreading God's Word through free sermon audio and much more. If you would like to know more about Audioverse, or if you would like to listen to more sermons, please visit www.audioverse.org.